Welcome back to MWO Sports, brought to you by CoolBet.co. Ryan Drury here. I'll be joined, as always, by Clarky and Steve Sabrin. Great show this week. We're joined by our friend Steve Coolius of Sirius XM NHL Radio to recap the Lightning going back-to-back. What's in store for the Leafs in the offseason, in his opinion, and what are they going to do about the ongoing refereeing controversy in the NHL? And how does the league transition into growing the game as they move from NBC over to TNT and ESPN? We'll also have a brief chat about a recent an NHL hire that uh, caught my eye in a negative way, I guess you could say. And we'll go over some hot bets for the weekend with Jake Bull and Moss of Cool Bet. You're listening to and watching MWO Sports brought to you by CoolBet.co. This is MWO Sports. Welcome back to another episode of MWO Sports brought to you by CoolBet.co. Ryan Drury alongside Clarky and Steve Sabrin. We're extremely pleased to be joined by NHL Sirius XM radio host Steve Coolius. Cooley, how you doing, brother? I'm great. Great to see you guys again. Summer's here. COVID's over. Let's have a ball now that hockey's over. Oh, except for the silly season. Absolutely. Silly season still to come. The draft, all that good stuff. But let's break it down. The Tampa Bay Lightning are back to back Stanley Cup champions. An always impressive feat, no matter what era you're talking about. But it's even more impressive in what we now lovingly know as the salary cap era and and maybe doubly impressive. Cooley, I don't know what your thoughts are on this, on how they had to win both of them in probably some of the weirdest circumstances we have ever seen as sports fans. I I mean, down in Tampa, it was a little more lax this year. They had basically a full barn, but really, really impressive run by the 2020 and 21 Tampa Bay Lightning, wouldn't you say? Yeah, and to me, I think my biggest takeaways from the two wins uh, in the bubble and out of the bubble in Tampa was the third line. Like, they, they lost to Washington. Well, they lost to uh, Pittsburgh and uh, Chicago, then they lose to Washington, they lose to Columbus, and it's got to change. It's got to change. Uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing again and again and thinking there'll be a different result. A result. No, other teams better have watched Tampa and said, oh, oh, we got to get grittier. We got to get leadership. We got to get tougher. And we got Yanni Gore. They got Goodrow, brought him in, uh, and they brought Coleman. To me, what they did last year was wow. They learned, they got it. They shut the Islanders out one nothing in Game Seven. They shut Montreal one nothing in Game Five. Those two wins were man. They didn't try to score the second goal and thought, oh no. They made sure they didn't give Montreal the Islanders anything. That impressed me so much. That's what I take away. Yeah, they got Kucherov and they got Vasilevsky and they got Stammer and da, 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 da. but that third line was the engine. It was the yes, I can and the group that would not let them fail. See Barkley Goodrow blocking those shots. That's what should carry on with other teams. Colorado, Edmonton, Toronto, they're the ones that need to learn from that. Speaking of third lines, how did a Montreal Canadian team made up of mostly third and fourth liners get to the final? Well, maybe we underestimated some of those third and fourth liners. Uh, they got something in Suzuki and Caulfield. Yeah, they, they kind of traded Caulfield for Jonathan Drouin. So they kind of they pushed Drouin aside for whatever he's going through. I don't know. And that brought in Caulfield. So that was good. Uh, Kotkaniemi, we can go back and forth on. I underrated Philip Deneau. I, I, did, I don't know how they're going to pay him. Like Michael Peck, how do you pay him? At least Peck could score uh, a little bit. So we underestimated some players. So Price and the big four deserve as much credit as anything. And when you can, you know, be tough and do some things and, and get away with it, that also helps. Yeah. But I think the group, I underestimated Clarkey. Now, can they even make the playoffs next year? I don't know, but they were better than I thought they were uh, at the start of the playoffs. Do you really think they're better, or did they did, did did the stars just align, and what was the refereeing right up their alley? I think a lot of things align. So, not calling penalties. I mean, it's going to sound like Toronto homerism, but the one that you would argue, if you are a Leaf fan, Eric Stahl in front of Dan O'Rourke, lassoed, buckled, tied up, and won the Calgary Stampede when he took Travis Dermott down. That's a, penalty. That's a penalty on a guy who's got the puck. Todd McDavid, two playoffs, losing series, not draw one penalty. Something's got to give. Like, yeah. just by saying that, something's got to give. So, stars the line. Tavares gets kicked in the head. Shifley is in the head. And then mm-hmm. Ford scores in his own net. Mm-hmm. And then Florin breaks his ankle. That's four major 
good things to have. Hey, but they still had a team that did they roll and roll like the North Stars in 81 and 91. And, and they kind of remind me of the Florida Panthers of 96. So are they better than, I still think they're better than I thought they were, but a lot of good things happen and much of which they still deserve. So I don't want to, I want to be realistic, but I don't want to pull the plug right out of the, you know, what Kucherov did to the Hab fans last night. <laughs> well, you know what? I mean, you look at the way the Habs played through the early part of the series, and there's no doubt they were opportunistic too. I mean, they were able to score on those breakaways and those giveaways and everything like that. Um, you mentioned penalties, Cooley. Last night, Montreal, and the, the player escapes me for Montreal, but he was on the rush, and he got hogtied from behind by a Tampa Bay player. That was no penalty called. And, you know, Simpson said it on the air. He said, wow, we've seen penalty shots for less call than that. Could Would you say Andrew. that was a gimme to Tampa Bay? And that because that to me was was an opportunity to tie the game. Yeah, that was the Chernak on Josh Anderson. Um, could there have been a call? So there was no stick infraction. And he didn't hold him. He never held him. And but he then, held him back. Uh, the, the only thing you can argue of the left leg of Anderson there would have been a glove contact by Chernak. But at that point, the play was already over and Anderson was falling. So for most of it, it was a brilliant defensive play. And the last thing the Montreal Canadiens and their fans can be doing is complaining about the officiating these playoffs. Exactly. <laughs> if it's going to be called the way it's going to be called next year, uh, A, they might not make the playoffs, and B, they're not going to get those breaks. There will be a crackdown on cross-checking because of this year's playoffs. Our goal is to make sure Montreal, it's kind of funny, because when the Habs were great in the 70s and when the Otters were great, they were complaining about the teams that were hooking and holding and slashing them. Yeah. But now that they're those teams, not, nothing to see here. All I'm saying is this. The hockey gods got it right. Those teams had great runs. But I want to see more, less let go. Mm. Less let go. Right. Moving forward. I think we're at that point right now, gentlemen. Because you know it's what? battle. Sorry, go ahead, Steve. Well, no, I was just going to say that um, beyond beyond the talk about penalties and stuff, uh, one of the positive notes I saw in this series is it was nice to see Steven Stamkos get a cup where he actually played in the cup final. I mean, that for him has to be a huge, huge relief and a huge professional win for him. That was my best moment, right? I, I give the credit to the one nothing wins and the third line and Yanni Gard and Goodrow and Coleman. We can't say their names enough. But to me, um, when they... When the puck was shot down the ice and they went in the corner and they were all jumping it down together, I saw Stammer. You could see him. He probably said, right, right, back to back. Yeah. And it's like, and I would, it justifies his first cup to be a part of the second cup. So we are most happiest for Steve Stamkos because the hockey gods have been brutal on him, gentlemen, but they gave one back. He earned and deserved it. Yeah, he could have scored one. Still eight goals and 18 points in 23 games, but he played every game. He might not have been 100%. But if you would have asked him at the start of the year, we're going to give you all 23 playoff games, whatever happens, he'd say yes. I'm most happy for him. And Andre Vasilevsky, how, what do you say about this guy? So winning series with shutouts, winning games after loss. How did this guy not win the Vesna, but still was the first team all-star? And from what I understand, it was the same voters. He won the Con Smythe as well, but how did he not win a Vesna? Well, the Vesna is the GMs. So they're the 31 idiots in that category. Uh, and the hockey writers uh, at least put them on first-team all-star. When you start voting, it's a popularity contest. Mm -hmm. uh, how does she look? How's the skirt? And uh, I don't know. But I like redheads and whatever. So you know what? I think Montreal went, oh, Edmund didn't win the Norris, and Vasilevsky didn't win the Vesna. That stinks. And guess what? The next game, Vasilevsky went and got a shutout, and Edmund just Edmund. Not that if they did win the awards, it would be different, but if you're looking at little edges, I think I want those guys angry because they still are the best at their respective positions. But anyway, I'm just with you on saying this. If these guys are so good pricing Vasilevsky, how come first round picks aren't used on goalies all, all the time? Right, Clarky? Yeah, good question.
Yeah, right? it's it, it's hard to say, right? And I mean, there's an argument to be made. And, and Cooley, you know this. We've seen it with numerous awards throughout the years. It almost felt like this year, and no disrespect to him because we all love Flower, but it, it almost felt like one of those Lifetime Achievement Awards for, for mm-hmm. Flower. Yeah. And hey, hey that's yeah. great. That's great. But yeah, Nikita but- Kucherov certainly had some interesting thoughts about uh, his buddy Andre not winning uh, the Vezna. I want to stick really quick before we keep talking about this great Lightning team uh, as we chat with our friend Steve Cooley is from Sirius. XM NHL radio about the refereeing and you mentioned the cross checking that seemed to be the number one thing I mean if you if you typed in Twitter hockey one of the first things that would pop up is refereeing cross checking I mean it was the number one term that was uttered all playoffs and seemingly all season long I'll believe it when I see it if the current people Steve Walkham and all the people that are continuously still involved with running how refereeing is done in this league I will believe it when I see it but Cooley in your in your opinion what needs to happen here? Like you mentioned the Connor McDavid thing. And if, if people don't know what you're referencing in the last two playoff series, including the play in round when they lost Chicago, he hasn't drawn a single penalty in the playoffs. How on earth is that possible when guys are wrangling him? You mentioned the Calgary stampede earlier. He gets that every time he goes down the ice. Uh, I've never seen somebody slash more next to Mario Lemieux in my entire life. What needs to happen here? Is it as simple as just telling guys, look, you can't do this. And the consistency is a disaster too. We saw so much stuff let go in games three and four, and then suddenly in game five out of nowhere, it was a penalty fest in the first period, and that frustrates guys. It all starts with the GMs. The refereeing is not the problem. The refereeing comes from the GMs. So they give them the mandate. When they told them, call everything, we're going to get rid of hooking and hockey in 05, 06 at the beginning of the lockout, Mm -hmm. they said, everything? Okay. And when they called and people looked like, Brian McCabe, what are you doing? They said, talk to your GM. We're calling everything. We are calling everything. Five on three galore, everything else. Well, it did work after three months. And hooking is gone. Imagine if somebody would have said in 1985, they're going to get rid of bench clearing brawls and hooking. (laughs) (laughs) What? Yeah. That'll never happen. Well, they did. Then tapping became a problem. And we've, we've called on the hands. If you tap the guy's stick and he loses the puck, it should be a penalty. You tap a stick and he doesn't, okay. If you tap it and you break it, so we, we've got a, a crackdown on that. So it starts with the GMs who say, just call three penalties each. I don't want my team. It's their fault. It's not Wacom's fault. It's not the referee's fault. If you tell the referees cross-checking crackdown, they will put their arms up all the time and still manage the game. They can't call what they don't see, but when they see it, I do believe they'll call it if they're instructed. They're the ones instructed by the league and the GMs, let them play. So they say, okay, I'm going to let them play. So remember, you get what the GMs want. I blame the GMs. I don't blame the refs. The refs will call the penalties if the mandate comes from the GMs. So seriously, you're telling me if the referee is four feet away from a guy who gets cross-checked and maybe broke a rib, he's not going to call it? Because that was happening. He said, the referee there said he didn't think it was vicious enough. <laughs> okay, good. That's yeah, good. that, that was the craziness. Tough. And See, how they can change like that on a dime when they hit the playoffs. See, that's it's, what it's, I don't understand crazy. is the viciousness has to do to me between a minor major. The action itself should always be a two-minute minor. If the stick comes up over the waist and there's a motion of a cross check and you hit the guy, that should be a penalty. Yeah, the, the argument will be... That play that, yeah, it was a, you can do a cross check push, right? You're in front of the net. So I don't think this is a penalty. Yep, for then, sure. Then there's what Weber did on Matthews, game one of the year. Yeah. So we have a standard. This, yep. this, and this is legal because Matthews only fell once. So yep. there's our new standard on cross checking, and that carrying over for 856 games and four rounds of playoffs. So if we decide that the push is okay, like you push them, mm-hmm. but anything else is, then the arm's got to go up. The argument they say is that what happens is something happens over here or they look at the clock and they go, ah, I missed the too many men on the ice panel. So when the other team does something like the cross check, they let both go. So they even it up in that regard. That will never change because it's yeah. figure skating on ice. It's judging this triple sow cow. We have to get used to it. That's how it works. If us four are a game and you say, Cooley, you missed a trip over there. Then there's a trip over here. That's not in front of the net. It's not going to affect the goal. 
I'm going to let it go to even it up. That will never change. You. Clarky, right. you're with me, right? Oh, I agree because we know it's it happens because Tim Peel did it and said it. You know, he, he was the one who wanted to call a penalty early in the game. and Yeah, we, we kind of know the... Uh, the little modus operandi, yeah, and and seeing what happened in these playoffs. I mean, the last thing I'll say about the refing because I want to talk about this Tampa team, but seeing what happened in the playoffs, I I feel bad for Tim Peel. The league scapegoated him, and you know that's that's league's modus operandi. We've seen guys do that in the NFL, Major League Baseball too. They find a scapegoat, and it's easier to just not admit you're doing something wrong. It's definitely just that one guy. For we sure. Get, we need to get Bill Daly on the show. I don't know. Uh, yeah, Bill, if you're listening, I know you do. Uh, let, you know, may, maybe he'll join us next week. I doubt it. Um, they're pretty tight lipped, the NHL front office. Cooley, this Tampa team, y- you look at the salary cap air and how hard it is to win. And then you look at the Chicago team that won three and five, LA two and three. Pittsburgh goes back to back for the first time since the Red Wings in the late 90s. Now Tampa's done it. And People, I know immediately what people are going to say, well, it's way less impressive because they were a a hundred billion dollars over the salary cap this year, uh, which is legal, by the way. The way they did that is legal. But when you look at the stats here, you mentioned Vasilevsky shutting out series to end series, getting shutouts. Incredible. They are 15 and 0 in the playoffs the last two years when they won cups after a loss, would you say in all the time, and it's recency bias, sure, but in all the time we've been watching hockey in this salary cap era, is this Tampa team, which is going to get broken up in some way, the best one you've seen? Would you stack them up against anybody, Chicago, Pittsburgh, whoever? I mean, I'd love a game between the 20, well, because the goaltending with Crawford, Antti Niemi won that cup in 2010. Antti Niemi, that's a tricky question to answer. And mm-hmm. the flyer goalie, which name escapes me right now, he wasn't that much better either, right? Michael so, Layton. Michael Layton was there, and Boucher was his backup. So that was the 2010 final. Uh, the Hawks were good. They were deep, too. Um, but recency bias and not losing back-to-back games and the, the big star power, although Chicago had it as well, Um if Tampa's not the best, then they're tied for the best in this group. But I, I do remember the Penguins were deep when they went four, uh, right? Like they went in 09 when Stahl was the third line center. But you go back to the two wins, Benito was three, and they were deep with Kessel and everything else. So these teams were all very good, all, be, all very deserving. Um, there's something special about Tampa, I think, for what we've seen the last two years. But if they are better, they're not head and shoulders better. They might be slightly better, but I still respected what Sutter's Kings did. Uh, how deep they were, Chicago, Pittsburgh. The Capitals were good for one year. I don't know if they're going to be there again. The window will close. No. So, uh, I, I, I like them, uh, the, the, the Lightning, a lot. I don't know by how much better than the rest of that crew. But I do, of all those teams, like Vasilevsky the best. Mm. Can I change to uh, the beloved Maple Leafs now, Ryan? Can I ask him a couple of questions? Will you allow me? Yeah, sure. I guess we can get into that part of the conversation okay, so where you where, have to bring up the Leafs. Where does where does this team go? I don't know if we've talked to Cooley since... Uh, Haven't. Right. So where is this team good enough um, to, to... Well... Do it, anything? <laughs> make it to the second round? Or do they need to make a major change? And when I say major change, is a guy like Mitch Marner, who's getting roasted still, uh, going to be the scapegoat here? I think what I would want to do or do compared to what's reality, I have to be in their world. The The big $11 million club and Nylander are not going anywhere. That's not happening. Uh, and the four defense that they have now are probably the four. Riley's probably going to have to wait. Uh, apparently he wants to take a discount, and his wife lives here, and they don't want to leave. So that could be a bonus for Toronto because I would never pay Riley that much money anyway. So in a capped world, Bill Belichick taught us a whole bunch of B and B pluses are better than a whole bunch of A pluses, other than Tampa and sitting one guy out for 56 games, which was perfectly legal. So mm-hmm. I look at it this. They need help for Jack Campbell. I would move off Freddie Anderson. Uh, unless he wants to come back for one year at 3.5. Like, you're going to have to do a favor. So he probably does not want to do that. So it's Campbell and who? Mrazic, Ranta, Drieger. Okay, so that's going to be a, a, a mini issue. But I think Campbell will be good enough if he stays healthy to get them into the playoffs. 
So then on defense, what do they want to do? They lose Dermot. Sandine comes in. Is Hall a good trade asset because he's two, 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 and two? They just they just re-signed Dermot today. I think that might have been to get rid of him. I mean, the favorite for Seattle, or it's Kerfoot. So what are they going to do to create a third line? What are they going to do when Hyman goes out there and realizes he's not getting six million dollars from everybody? That's just tech. We just got Erickson X sign as an RFA and Ryan Nugent Hawkins. You know what they did? They got the AAV at five point one to get their their money. So there's no way five point one higher for Hyman. He has to know that he's in the fours just like that. But I'm here. I go eight years in Toronto. You know, I probably won't play the last two at four three point seven five. That's it. That's the market. Taylor Hall might have to sign for Tyler to Foley money. Are the Leafs interested in Hall? Do they play him? To me, is what are they going to do to kill penalty? Barkley Goodrow, I'd rather have than some of the other guys that we're talking about. Like uh, another Toronto guy, older, can kill penalties. Imagine that having to kill penalty against Boston. So they don't score goals in five seconds. So what are they going to do for grit? What are they going to do to augment some of these guys? This is Kyle Dubas's summer. He will either, either be the summer of Steve or the summer of George. If he slips on an envelope, he will not have a summer of 2022 next year. What he does in the next 20 days will dictate the season they have and whether he has a job next year. Yeah, he cannot stand still. He cannot stand still. Right. Misses the playoffs, fire. Makes the playoffs and gets embarrassed, fire. Makes the playoffs and loses in the first round. If it was me, I'd probably say that's enough. I think one of the top guys is on the block. And I think, as you know, when you have success in the organization, which they did with the Raptors, moving DeMar DeRozan for a guy, the pressure's on. And they're going to – I mean, I know it doesn't mean anything to hockey at the end of the day, but I bet they're saying one of these guys got to go. You got to do something. But May, I, I, You might be right, and we, we're going to find out in the next 21 days or whatever. Yeah. I don't think they're touching those guys. Uh, and obviously, I would – move Nylander before I would move Marner myself. Marner just became, whether you like him or not, let's see how he learns from this, but a first team all-star is as good as the prize you can get at the end of the year. <laughs> and the Leafs don't get any awards. They and how many how many games now in the playoffs without a goal? How many? 18? 18. Yeah. yeah. 18. I'm yeah, kidding. it's it's hard to say. There, There's going to be changes for sure. And I mean, y- you even look at, you know, our, our recent champion twice over, Tampa, like You know, despite everybody making jokes about them being 18 million over the salary cap, which, yes, by the way, is legal. And I have an ironic story about that. They're going to get broken up like Goudreau is not coming back. I doubt Blake Coleman is coming back. Are they uh, Tyler Johnson, a guy they've tried to move before for sure? Not coming back. Uh, You look down the lineup at some of their depth, but here's the that's the bad news, I guess, for a team like Tampa. As bad a news as you can have after winning two straight Stanley Cups. Here's the good news and the bad news for the rest of the league, though. They've still got a dominant core, and Tampa, unlike Toronto and many other teams, you know, without even mentioning a team like Buffalo, they draft so, so well. So guess what? It doesn't really matter that they're losing Goudreau, an effective player. Pat Maroon, are they going to be able to keep him around? The three-peat guy, I don't know. They draft so well. Guess what? They got guys coming. They don't trade away first and second and third round picks like cake, like Kyle Dubas has. They don't do that stuff. So unlike unlike Tampa, Toronto doesn't exactly have a legion of elite young guys or even what I'd call useful young guys coming along to save the day here. So you're right. They got to do something big. I don't necessarily know if it's at the level of getting rid of a Marner, but something is going to change for sure. I just want to make note as well, Cooley, and you mentioned the GMs with the refereeing. In 2015, let me take you back. We'll harken back to the Blackhawks days. Their third cup. Patrick Kane was hurt for the last month and a half of the season, and the Blackhawks stored his salary on LTIR. He was only making, I think, $7 million at the time. And in doing that, at the trade deadline, that cap space allowed them to acquire guys like Antoine Vermette, and they made a couple other additions as well that ate up that space. And then miraculously, game one, he was back. And Tampa Bay, who lost to them in the final that year, by the way, at the GM meetings that summer, said, we should not allow stuff like this to happen. 
and they put it to a vote. Steve Eiserman was still the GM then. They put it to a vote, and it was voted down. The GMs said, no, this rule's fine. I bet you Toronto was one of the first to sign off on that because it allowed them to eat Horton's money and Clarkson's money. And now Tampa does it, and everyone's upset. Guess where you guess who you're actually mad at? You know, I I just I, I find it funny that people are like, oh, well, it's it's an invalid championship because they they oh. cheated and were way over the cap. You know what? Talk to the Yankees about money and winning championships. You oh. know, it, just because you spend money doesn't mean you win championships. I mean, there's teams out there that have have one with low, I mean, uh, uh, lo low salaries and, and everything else. So, I mean, that, that's Berets. a very hollow, hollow argument. Um, I will say Toronto should try to get Pat Maroon because the way he's winning championships <laughs> in the last se three seasons, he's yeah. a magnet. Yeah. He's still signed. So yeah. uh, a couple of things. They did give up a first round pick for Barkley Goodrow and a first round pick for Blake Coleman and a first round pick for David Savard. So they yeah, did that. Okay. So they, so they did. So those, but they were, but they gave up three first round picks just because you give up a first round pick for Nick Foligno and he doesn't churn out the way you wanted. You can't say why they trade for Owen Nolan, but when they got him, you say they got Owen Nolan. So, sometimes it doesn't work. Like even Antoine Vermette scored one big goal for the Hawks in that run. People look back at that and say it wasn't a good trade. It was a first round pick. Well, you won the cup with him and he scored one big goal. Yeah, but only one big goal. But if he doesn't score you, so, so to me, the way I look at it is I didn't know the GMs voted down that proposal. So that's great information. I didn't know about that. Um, no star player is going to sit out for any more than a realistic two-week period above his injury. They're not King. If King could have played three days later, he's not sitting out so they can go get these guys. If Kucherov could have played halfway through the year, he would have returned halfway through the year. There's yeah. no doubt to me about that. And I don't think in a capped world, when somebody gets creative and those are in the rules, you're breaking the rules. Those are right now the rules. That's when right. change the rules, go ahead and change them. Yep. So Maroon's still under contract. Their fourth line next year will be Ross Colton, Patrick Maroon, and Matthew Joseph. They have to lose Tyler Johnson, by my count, and at least Ryan McDonough or Gord or Sorelli or Kalorn because they've got no backup goalie under contract. They only have five defense under contract. they got to re-sign Ross Colton. Maroon's making 900000 so they got a 1.1. They're going to keep him. They need to – Coleman and Goodrow are no chance. they got to shed two major players. And one, if, if you have Tyler Johnson here, they got to sit and send somebody else further away. And it's not going to be Mikhail Sergachev. I'll tell you that much. No. No, no, it's not going to be Sergachev. And, I mean, yeah, you're looking at guys like Kalorn. Is Pallad a casualty? Johnson for sure. Yep, absolutely. I think Seattle might end up being a destination for him. But here, I guess, is my point. Yes, Tampa traded those first-round picks. But at the depth of the draft, Pallad, seventh-rounder. Kucherov, third-rounder. Point, second-rounder or third-rounder. Uh, my memory's hazy there. And then you look you look down at the trades they made with Sergachev. Almost all the guys you mentioned there, they drafted drafted them Matthew Joseph this Colton kid like Toronto my point I guess was Toronto it's easy generally to get a first round pick to turn out where you make hay is second down and they don't find anybody helpful there look up the last 10 years of draft why is this turning into an anti-leaf rant it's this not not I'm part of the program that. I'm just saying that for people that are, I guess my point is for people that are going, well, Tampa, their time's over now because they're going to have to lose X, Y, and Z. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. We'll we'll they see. have one of the best front offices and yeah. scouting staffs in sports. And I'm also and glad I'm glad to see two former great Leafs, Curtis McElhaney and Luke Shen, win a cup again. <laughs> Yes, Beautiful. again. Cooley, I want to change topics here because Ryan's getting off and uh, on Go the for it. rant here. Um, let's talk broadcasting. I'm not going to ask you to criticize the uh, Hockey Night in Canada broadcast with about 16 guys on the intermissions and everything else, or that Sportsnet put a guy who's a huge Leaf fan uh, in charge of a Montreal Canadian uh, stream. But I want to ask you about ESPN and what it's going to mean to the, to the league in the States moving forward and how this could grow the game. 
Well, ESPN and TNT will com- com- uh, compete against each other, right? You've got Messier yep. and Pretzky and, and Kathy uh, Campbell, Chelios and, and, and everything else that they've done. Uh, but they're going to have to be able to deliver, right? So to me, it's great to have those people. And I don't want to sound self-serving, but who is going to be the person that stir- stirs the drink in the studio shows? Who's going to be able to say to Wayne, no, disagree or whatever? Because clearly NBC's problem was it was too vanilla. I go to Basket Robbins, 31 flavors. When I get there, I don't order vanilla ice cream. <laughs> if I'm going to Basket Robbins, I want to get some. I'm olive. I need a little flavor here. So I'll ESPN and TNT do everything. Studio show, the yep. excitement, and everything else will dictate it. They can take it to another level or just be another vanilla, Clarky. So yeah, yeah, okay. I just I'm just trying to think of some uh, some well, broadcasters with energy. Maybe is it is it Wayne's old coach Barry Melrose? What about the guy the we're talking to, Ryan? He would be uh, good on ESPN. Are you kidding me? Cooley would be unbelievable. He's unbelievable for us all the time, and we don't even pay him for this. So uh, <laughs> imagine how good he'd be on ESPN. Come on, hey, I, I I'm looking. Come on, hey. No, it's uh, it's one of those things. I agree, Cooley, and they have a real opportunity here because if if you can't get the game now with these stars that are in the league and American stars like Austin Matthews. I know he plays in Canada, but if you can't grab an audience and find a way now on ESPN, boy, uh, the NHL, uh, I think they'll always kind of be the little brother, but if you can't start getting a foothold and getting more people in the seats and buying stuff and buying into the sport, uh, that'll be a failure. That'll be looked at as a failure. They want to increase revenue, especially after the pandemic, like all sports. But I agree. They they have a real opportunity here. And uh, let's just say the NHL's made some interesting hires at a league perspective over the last couple of weeks. That's for sure. But I agree. Uh, they have a real opportunity here to do something special. And I hope they can, Cooley. Yeah, um, but let's be honest here. Since Gary took over, the curve of this league has only gone like this. It has. The dip, yep. The dip was in a couple lockouts, but the one great lockout was the great flood. It was a necessity for the product and to make sure the league worked. You're only as strong as your weakest link. And there wouldn't be, other than the least, and maybe Montreal, there wouldn't be any other teams in Canada. There wouldn't be Columbia. We'd have a 12 team league. And if you want that, that's great. So under the Batman administration, this is gone. I'm going to go right to my curve on the screen. It's gone like this. So if you're saying ESPN and TNT that the league's no, the league's already doing this. Can they keep this going? When realistically, will they ever be among the American sports? No, they're just trying to get as close to, to them as possible. We're mm-hmm. biased, and we'll watch the Canadian sport, our sport, over all the American sports. But it's not ingrained. Now, have they made inroads in the southern states? Unbelievable. Has Sidney Cross become the most famous and, and uh, best athlete in Pittsburgh all time? He has. He has. People are moving out to the suburbs of the United States. Realistically, your kid can play hockey, Cole Caulfield, at 5'7", 162. Maybe he can play baseball at that sport, but he's not playing in any other sports at that sport. He's not an NFL wide receiver at that thing. So the realistic thing is it is it has gone like this, and ESPN and TNT plus the money they've paid is only going in this direction. If anybody doesn't think from February 1st, 93, to where we are now, that Gary's taken over and done unbelievable things, they're dreaming in technicolor. The sky is the limit, and the league is going like this. Onward and upward. You're absolutely right. They're making money. Steve, go ahead. Yeah, Cooley, what about the uh, the Olympic side of it? Do you think the NHL needs the Olympic exposure to help keep that curve going up? I think the Olympics needs it more than the NHL. The NHL pays a price to go, shutting the league down and everything else, and they don't see the residual money right away. But to sell the sport, I think it's always a, it's a lost leader. So the only way they're going now is if the insurance and blah, 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 all this stuff is paid. The league says they're not paying it. The IOC's got to pay it. And apparently they're not. And the COVID insurance is through the roof. The PA knows it. So we're not going to go. So I think the way it's going to be moving forward, where are the Olympics? China. Oh, see you later. Where are the Olympics? Calgary. We're going. I think we're going to use that approach, and it makes the – remember, there's a lot of U.S. owners that don't care and don't want to go, and the real truth, going this year would be the best year again for Canada to go because I don't see – if you put the teams together right now, I don't see a way – well, unless there's a bad call – that Canada would not win anyway. So it's probably in the American owner's best interest that this is 
Who's the second line center? Eichel's going to be in traction with his neck. Like they're not deep enough yet. They will be, and they're coming. Um, and the Russians want to go down because OB would be his last year, unless he's going to go at forty. Uh, but anyway, I I believe it does work. They don't see the numbers right away, but it does throw the game. Great question, my friend. Internationally, absolutely, I agree. Uh, Cooley, we really appreciate you doing this. It's despite being a shortened season, it's been a long year. Uh, go get some rest. I'd like to ask you before we let you go, Baskin Robbins. What flavor are you getting at Baskin Robbins? I'm a Moose Tracks guy. What are you getting there? I'm getting cookie dough oh. or peppermint with chocolate chip sprinkles, something I did not get in NBC. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely, brother. Steve Coolius of Sirius XM NHL Radio. I agree. Mint chip. It's a good one. Don't pass on it. And don't pass on Cooley. You can catch him on Sirius XM NHL Radio throughout the week. We really appreciate this, brother, as always. Thank you so much. No problem. Elevator down. Absolutely. All right. We'll take a quick break here on MWO Sports. When we come back, we got to talk a little bit more about the NHL and some of their hiring decisions recently that have sparked some controversy, I guess. And uh, we'll also have our betting segment coming up as well here on MWO Sports brought to you by CoolBet.co. This is MWO Sports. Welcome back to MWO Sports, brought to you by CoolBet.co. Ryan Drury still alongside Clarky and Steve Saber. And big thanks to our buddy Steve Coolius of Sirius XM NHL Radio. Man, that guy's just the best. He gave us over a half hour of his time. He's tired at the end of the season. We love the guy for it. Cooley's the best. Uh, guys, let's continue chatting a little bit about the NHL. And we kind of started uh, burgeoning the subject a little bit with Cooley there at the end, the NHL and their new rights deal in the States. It's a big deal to have your sport on ESPN one. And of course, TNT as well, a very well-watched channel. We know all about their basketball coverage. The NHL, like I said to Cooley has a real opportunity here to continue to grow the game, get more eyes on it. The league itself made an interesting hire in the name of that. I guess recently, this is about a week ago and uh, they hired a 19 year old, TikTok star, which is a strange sentence to utter, but here we are in 2021. TikTok star, if that's a thing, to be the voice of the fans. This guy's gonna, this kid is from, he's from Toronto. His name's, I believe his name's Josh Richards or something. He's on TikTok and he's working for the league. Like they're paying him to be the voice of the fans. And it's a little bit controversial because he has a show on Barstool. And if you're not familiar with Barstool and what that is, Dave Portnoy and those guys, uh, you must be living under a rock if you're listening to sports media. They're pretty controversial for good reason, Uh, particularly their owner, Dave Portnoy, who is, by the way, a 44-year-old man. And he hosts a podcast with this 19-year-old kid called BFFs. It's awful. It's a terrible show. Um, You know, not to toot our horn here. I'd rather listen to our show in perpetuity if I was stranded on a desert island than listen to that or even log on to TikTok for that matter. But hey, I'm 30. I'm 30. And so I don't use it. And I don't think that I, I want your guys' opinion on this. I mean, you're both a, just a little bit older than me, Clarky, just a little bit older than me. And I want to know your opinion on this because this guy is working on Barstool. He he essentially yeah, yeah, makes videos yeah. on TikTok where he just raps to songs. Yeah. Tweets not great stuff. And this guy's going to be the voice of the fans. Yeah. For all the things that the NHL says, oh, we want to include more LGBTQ fans. We want to include more, you know, people of color and reach out to yeah, more fan base. Yeah, so they yeah. hire this scrawny white kid who's, you know, involved with a pretty Ryan, controversial company. 25 million followers this kid has. I don't care. Well, well, the NHL does. 25 million followers followers this kid has i think it's a brilliant move they're they're reaching out to the youth 25 oh. million viewers not only that he is a huge leaf fan and on day one of af- actually being hired by the league he said on tiktok f the uh, habs 
What like what? what yeah, else? great. Oh, perfect. What, what else is better than that? That's who we want as the voice of the fans. Another Brilliant. Leaf fan for Ryan, sure. Ryan, you're well, way it. past the demo of this. I'm sorry to tell you, you're way past. You're an old fogey now. Okay, uh -huh. you well, are. You are. You're past it. What I would five million. 25 million. Just think of that. Do they get 25 million people watching a hockey game down there? No. No, thank you very much. Yeah, but he's Canadian. He has no connection to the U.S. market outside of dumb podcast. What do you think Canadian? all 25 like, million not, followers are in Canada? Come it's on. not. It has nothing to do with where we are with TikTok. It's no. all about the views. It's all about the hits. And you know what? From a content perspective, it doesn't have to be good content because, again, you're talking about 15 year old boys or 15 year olds for that matter, walking around my son's on TikTok, and he shows me some of the stuff he is amused with. And yeah, it's a completely different market, completely different audience. And it's an expansion of what they're trying to do. So here's my problem though. The demographic you just described already watches hockey. No, not young true. white 15 year old boys. No, I said 15 year old. Uh, I, and then I added 15 year old. They all watch general. hockey in the States. They all watch hockey eh? in the States. No, but why would anybody in the States care who this guy is outside of making dumb? He's got 25 million followers. Yeah. So Cristiano Ronaldo has more followers. Of, what if 15 million of them are in the States and 10 million of them don't watch hockey? I like, doubt anything this guy does is going to make them watch a hockey game. Oh. Uh. Whatever. I don't. Uh, me personally, Christian. Okay, but well, here's the You're thing, right? They may not watch a hockey game, but they may go out and buy merch. Maybe. I seriously doubt this is going to yield any difference in terms of any team's bottom line. I'd rather them, if you want a, a Leaf guy, I'd rather them just get Justin Bieber to do it. I'd yeah. rather them just get Bieber. He wrote a song about the Leafs. Not about them, but he made a music video all about his love for the Leafs to one of his new hit songs. I'd rather you just did that rather than this guy who's connected to this, you know, not very well reputed. Yeah, I just uh, think that's ridiculous. Like, Justin Bieber's not going to go on TikTok 10 times a day talking about hockey. What do you need him on TikTok for to increase views on the NHL? You have to... You have to be on different platforms. You can't, like, you have to fish where the fish are. You have to expand your horizons. And if there's a kid on TikTok who loves hockey and he's got 25 million viewers or followers, I guess, what? I don't see what the big deal is. We don't know how much this guy's getting paid, do we? No, do I don't. Idea? I don't, but I just find it, I just find it odd that for all the talk that the NHL does about wanting to expand their audience, young white boys and young white people, especially in this Canada, they're watching hockey already. They're already watching hockey. People of color, people that are essentially at the end of the day, and I know this bothers some people, offended by what Barstool is and what a lot of their hosts and people, mainly Dave Portnoy, stand for, aren't going to get attached to something like this. I, I just think Cristiano Ronaldo has mo more followers than anybody on Instagram. People in the United States still won't watch soccer. I, you know, I, I just think that this was a stupid hire. It's the NHL being the NHL. Great. Let's all just, sign on. To okay. TikTok. Just, just if you have time tonight, when you go on TikTok, you guys no. just watch, look at, look at a guy. Um, he, he's very funny. Um, and his TikTok name is at goalie underscore life 29. At goalie underscore life 29. He's got some funny dances and everything on there. Yeah, that's Chris Clark. That's you, dude. I'm not, I'm not like, don't, don't, you can't pull a fast one on me, man. I may be 30 now. I'm not, I wasn't born Can yet. Can we get our producer to put that graphic up, please? At was, goalie underscore life 29. We're not doing that. We're not doing that. You can pay for a promotion, Clarky. Anyway, I like Josh. He's good in my books. Great. Fine. I think it's a stupid hire. That's just my opinion. All right. We'll, uh, we'll take a quick break here. When we come back, we will chat with uh, one of our experts from coolbet.co coming up here. Pat, unfortunately unavailable. Chris Abbott, he's in Vegas. He's enjoying laying some chips down. We will have Jake Bolin Moss of Coolbet to talk about some hot bets to make this weekend. All-star game around the corner, Euro finals. Lots to talk about here on MWO Sports brought to you by coolbet.co. This is MWO Sports.
Welcome back to wrap things up here on MWO Sports brought to you by CoolBet.co. Ryan Drury alongside wagering expert Jake Bull and Moss from CoolBet. Pat and Chris are busy. They're tied up, but no worries. We've got plenty of experts on hand and Jake is one of those. Jake, how you doing, brother? Not bad. Happy to be the uh, 1C option for this uh, show today. <laughs> oh, no. You're making us sound like terrible people here. Uh, no, just, no. Just not kidding. at all. We appreciate your insight. Let's dive right in. Uh, sports are raging along here. The summer, just because the NHL is over, doesn't mean there's not lots of great stuff to bet on. Let's dive right in here. UFC 264. Poirier's got another big fight here. Those are always big draws for the UFC crowd. What do you like here? Yeah, looking at Poirier McGregor, uh, immediately I look right at Poirier, to be honest. You look at the last two fights. um, McGregor took him down in the first round, under two minutes. But that fight was way back in 2014. We're talking seven years ago. McGregor's aged a lot. Poirier has too. You've seen them back in January. And Poirier was able to take a few more shots in that first round. I think McGregor did kind of – he won that first round for sure. But I think Poirier kind of stood in there. He realized he could take some shots and then took advantage in that second round. Those leg kicks were hurting McGregor. Um, Poirier has won six of his last seven, four inside the distance. And I like Poirier by TKO, KO, submission, or disqualification. So those are your four options. Uh, it's going at plus 150 right now. You can always take Poirier money line if you're not too sure. But I like that one. I think this fight is staying inside the distance, um, whether it is McGregor or Poirier. But I do like Poirier. I think he knows he can take those strikes from McGregor early, stay in there, and then take care of business uh, maybe second or third round uh, like we saw in the second fight in January. Yeah, I like that bet. And I mean, hey, all respect to McGregor, like you said, but in the UFC, probably more than any other sport, legends fall and they fall hard. The Iceman, Anderson Silva, Brock Lesnar, Ronda Rousey, you look throughout and the legends, when they fall, they fall hard, and this could be one of those. Let's look at Euro 2020, and I hate referencing the year 2020. They should have just changed the title, but boy, what an unbelievable final. What a bounce back here for UEFA and football fans around the world. England at home at Wembley against the Italians. It's going to be an absolute stunner. If England wins, that country might just melt down. It's going to be incredible. Haven't won anything since 66. What do you like on this one? Yeah, well, it's coming home. I gave out England as actually the future bet when the tournament started. But for oh. this game, yeah, well, no, not to brag because I'm sure they'll lose and choke that. But <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, for this one, I've got the under two goals. Um, I think a lot of early on, it's going to be a lot of feeling out process, big possession game for both teams. Uh, I think both are actually strong, uh, sound defensively. I know Italy's defense had a little bit of critique coming into the tournament, but they've been all right. They didn't allow any goals in the group play. Uh, they've allowed one goal in each of their three matches coming into this one. Um, but no more than that. England has kept everyone off the board, except the Danes in their semifinal match. It was a great free kick by Denmark, but really outside of that, the uh, the Danish didn't really have that many opportunities to score. So I think it's going to be a big feeling out process. I think our worst case here, uh, maybe a one one push to extra time or uh, two nothing finish for one side or the other. Um, so worst case push, but I like the under two in this one between these two clubs. Yeah, I think that's a solid call. I would say arguably the two best defensive sides in Euro 2020. Italy is always sound defensively, and they got my man from Chelsea, Jorginho, running the midfield. They've got a chance here, but I have a funny feeling that it just might be coming home to England. Uh, we talked earlier with our friend Steve Coolius of Series XM NHL about the back-to-back champion Tampa Bay Lightning. You are thinking maybe they will not go for a three-peat, which is something unheard of in hockey these days, let alone back-to-back. You've got an interesting pick here that I actually really like for the Stanley Cup winner next year, don't you? Yeah, a ridiculously early pick for the Stanley Cup winner of 2022. Um, I like the Carolina Hurricanes. They're going at plus 1,300 right now in their future. The issue, the only issue I have with the Hurricanes right now is what's going to happen with Dougie Hamilton. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming they're going to keep Nadalkovich on. He's an RFA uh, coming into this season. I assume they'll get a contract figured out with him. But if Dougie Hamilton doesn't stay on, that's that's their guy on the back end. Like That's their quarterback on the power play. So I think if they can figure that out or at least find a guy or two to fill his spot, This team has a great culture. They got a great coach in Rob Brendamore, who just got a three-year extension. Uh, They got a great core up front, the Sveshnikovs, the Ajos, guys like that. Um, I think 
it, all three facets, facets of the game, they're impressive in. And then if you add special teams, that's another great facet of their game. They ran into a hot Tampa team this year who obviously went on to win the cup. Um, but I think they're going to give teams problems next year. They were first in their division and no reason why they can't uh, go all the way next year. I like that pick a lot. I agree. Uh, that team will go through a wall for Rod Brindamore. And hey, even if Hamilton leaves, they still got Slavin. They still got Pesci. They're solid there. Maybe if Hamilton walks and they can't keep him, do they target a guy like Seth Jones, who's got one more year at 5.9? Carolina will get inventive for sure. I like that pick a lot at plus 1,300. Going to be a uh, interesting year next year in the NHL. Silly season around the corner for free agency. Jake, we really appreciate this, brother. Thanks so much. I love the picks. Yeah, thanks a lot, guys. All right, remember, guys, you can listen to this show Friday nights at 6 on CKNX AM 920 and CKNX.ca. You can find the podcast on all the best podcast networks. Watch the show Friday nights at 8, Sunday nights at 9 with our friends on Whiteman TV. And remember, we debut on our YouTube channel Friday nights at 9 as well. You can follow us on social media at MWO underscore sports. For myself, Ryan Drury, our guest, Steve Coolius, Jake Bolin Moss from CoolBet and Clarky and Steve. We appreciate you guys listening to and watching. Watching MWO Sports brought to you by CoolBet.co. <laughs>